We start with Decision 2024. The Arizona primaries are one year out. There are two Democratic congressional primaries with five or more candidates. We're talking to them on Square Off. Today, there's a wide open race in Phoenix's third district to succeed Congressman Ruben Gallego. He's decided to give up the safe Democratic seat to run for the U.S. Senate. The 3rd District is one of Arizona's two congressional districts with Hispanic majorities. The district covers central, west, and southwest Phoenix and reaches northwest into Glendale. How safe is this Democratic seat? Ruben Gallego coasted to his fifth term in office in 2022 with 77% of the vote over his Republican opponent. The four candidates in the 3rd District Democratic primary are Phoenix Vice Mayor Yasemin Ansari, Laura Pastor, a Phoenix City Council member and daughter of longtime Congressman Ed Pastor, Raquel Taran, a former state senator and Arizona Democratic Party chair, and Hector Yaramillo, a public school educator. A fifth candidate is in the works. The winner of this Democratic primary could expect to hold the seat for several terms. We're joined by one of the candidates, Phoenix Vice Mayor Yasmin Ansari of District 7. Welcome to Square Off. Thank you so much. It's a crowded field, so draw the sharpest contrast between yourself and your opponents. What's the biggest difference? Uh, well, Bram, I think the biggest difference is my deep policy experience and background on the issues that are facing our country most deeply right now. So I studied national security both in undergrad and graduate school. I also have worked on the issue of the climate crisis for my entire career. Um, formerly, formerly served as a climate advisor at the United Nations to the current Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez. And I have a record of getting things done. If you look at the accomplishments that I've had on the Phoenix City Council in my district. They are immense. I was at the forefront of passing the city's first ever climate action plan, the most ambitious, one of the most ambitious fleet transition plans in the country. I helped establish a Phoenix Promise program to help with tuition assistance for students and with the upcoming Phoenix Bond program, if passed by voters this November, about 113 million of that $500 million package is direct investments into District 7. And that did not happen by accident. It was a lot of work to get there. So I think that, you know, I am someone with who's a doer, who is, you know, experience and education and, and can really get things done for the district. And you've been on the council for two years now. A little uh, over two years. The climate crisis, as you say, has been your focus for several years. What are the, are the two, or three, two or three things you would try to do in Congress to prepare Phoenix for a hotter future and protect our most vulnerable residents? First and foremost, we need more investment from the federal government in building resiliency to climate impacts. Unfortunately, we already have locked in significant climate impacts that will come. So whether that's more, you know, I, I've joined the leaders who are calling on FEMA to declare heat as a natural disaster. That will unlock significant ability and resource management abilities from the federal government to be able to support Phoenix because we know that heat actually kills more individuals than tornadoes, floods, other natural disasters combined. So we need more support there. If I, I just want to so it's a, it's a big abstract problem. There's nothing we can do right now that's going to lower the temperature. So bring that more to ground level, you know, into people's home. What, what ha needs to happen at the ground level to help protect, pe pr help protect people? So before getting to that, I do just want to say there is there are things that can happen right now. The number one culprit for why we are in a climate crisis is the oil and gas industry. I do want to emphasize that it is very, very important that we stand up to big oil, stand up to these industries that are doing everything in their power to roll back Biden's climate policies and investments. So that is really critical at the federal level and something that I will be doing as a congresswoman. At the ground level, we know that heat is a preventable, heat deaths are preventable. So I would say, First and foremost, there are a lot of resources that are already available. Phoenix operates 62 cooling centers across the city. MAG has a heat relief network with a lot of resources available. We also have programs to help retrofit people's homes um, if, if ACs aren't functioning properly. So it's really, I think we need to do a better job educating residents about these programs, but also we need residents to, to make sure they are prepared going into heat season. Are those cooling centers open around the clock? We have one currently available around the clock. Do they need to be open around the clock? They do, often? and actually the mayor and I have been working with the governor's office on this issue. We hope to, um, you know, we hope to have some progress on this soon because we do need more 
cooling options available. One thing that I have led on is bringing a cooling bus to the zone. Um, it's just much easier to bring a bus with AC, with water, working on finding some more. And this weekend, we're adding a couple of trailers to the zone um, with staffing capacity as well, because we know that you know staffing is the biggest issue um, that we have when, when putting up new facilities. Let's talk about kitchen table issues. Rising inflation, food and housing costs have to be hitting your district uh, hard. Uh, how would you tackle that in Washington? We need to fight for better wages and better protections for workers. Um, in the past few weeks, I've met with airport workers at Sky Harbor. I've met with individuals who are, who are working at our hotels here in downtown Phoenix. And hearing their stories of food insecurity, of you know, not having health insurance, of not of being one paycheck away literally from being homeless, that's unacceptable. So I'm intending to work hand in hand in them on increasing wages. Um, Right now, you know, we talk about a $15 minimum wage. That is not even close to what's needed in the year 2023. Um, so fighting for better wages for them and, and calling on private companies to make sure they're taking care of their workers. Do, did you support repealing the renter tax? That was viewed as helping out uh, average folks. You know, it's tough. I, um, it's going to make a big impact to the city of Phoenix's budget. And so I was not in support of repealing the rental tax because we're worried about the critical services that it will cut at the city level. Um, so, you know, I was encouraged to hear the governor yesterday talk about how she intends to work with both sides to try to backfill that funding. Um, but, you know, I do recognize that, that that's helpful. I think there are much more important ways that we can work to help working families, and that comes with actually taking care of people in their workplace. As a congresswoman, would tax increases be off the table for you? Um, not for the wealthiest in our society, absolutely not. I think that corporations um, and billionaires in this country are not paying their fair share, and that's why we don't have a social safety net for our residents. You're going to have to vote on immigration border issues at some point if you're elected. Does President Joe Biden and his administration understand what's happening at Arizona's border and the migrant surge and how to handle it? I believe that they do. I think that when we saw the end of Title you know, 42, we expected, you know, there was a lot of fear mongering around what would happen. And it wasn't this, you know, mass migration that was expected. I think what I will be pushing for is more legal pathways to citizenship. We know that immigrants who come to this country, um, whether they come from the border or whether they're coming overseas, they are coming here in pursuit of a better life. They want to be part of the fabric of our country. And so I think we just need to create more pathways and in the meantime, support our border communities who are taking on the burden and make sure they have the safety resources that they need. If you're elected, is there a member of Congress you really admire and who's you might pattern yourself after? Great question. There are, there are several. Um, my, one of my favorite current members of Congress is Congressman Greg Kassar. He uh, is a, was on the Austin City Council and now uh, is a congressman. And we align on many issues from workers' rights to um, he just did a thirst strike on the Capitol uh, to, to draw attention to the need for mandatory water breaks for construction workers um, following their governor's crazy decision. So I think that's someone that represents the young generation of future elected officials. You know, I'm 31 years old. I have grown up with mass shooting drills at my school. I've been growing up thinking about, you know, should I have kids because the climate crisis is right here. And we need more young people in elected office and it's time for this generation. It's my generation that will have to deal with the most pressing issues of our time. And, and I look forward to being there. This district was created in accordance with the Voting Rights Act uh, as a majority Latino district. Your opponents say, uh, can say they reflect the, the lives, the lived experiences of many people in the district. Can you say that too? I can. I'm the daughter of immigrants as well, and I think it's really important in the United States of America that um, immigrants work together and those with immigrant backgrounds come together. You know, my parents fled the country of Iran in, in the 70s when the revolution occurred, um, and my mom was just a teenager. She came here all by herself. Her My grandfather was imprisoned in Iran, and they went through significant struggles to, to find the American dream. You have an advantage as a city council member. You, uh, you, you're the, you lead the pack in donations mm -hmm. and fundraising, half a million dollars. You have an advantage as a a city council member in that some people might donate to you for your campaign but may want something else at the city level. How do you handle that? 
I am very, very clear. I mean, nobody has ever been, you know, transactional with me. I work really, really hard. Uh, brand, that's something about me that I think I can also say stands out in the pack. I know that I will outwork every candidate in the race. Um, and that's the same approach I take to fundraising. You know, I do hours of call time, lots of events, um, and I have a wide network. Again, my deep background in, in climate policy means I have support um, from around the country. I just got an endorsement from Ben Rhodes, who was President Obama's former national security advisor. Um, and that's the kind of, you know, network I'm building to really be able to invest that funding into getting out the vote in the district. Um, Do you expect to re remain in office all the way through the ele that is election my plan, day? Yes. All the way. Well, not, it, not through election no, day. Right. Uh, you have to resign in April. In April? Yes. This coming April? Yes. Okay. Got to end it there. Yasmin Ansari, thanks very much. Best Thank you luck. so much.